Salam alaikum. Good morning, my fellow presenters and I send our best wishes to you all. We appreciate your time and thank you for attending our workshop, Wellness in the Workplace, Protecting Your Employees. My name is Paul Groom, Director of DHUB, the GCC Development Partner for Sosa Health. Our agenda today has been created to provide in-depth detail on Stoza Health following the first webinar on the 9th of September. And our objective is to provide you in much more detail how Stoza works, its many benefits for both employee and employer, and finally to give a business case. We have some special guests today. And as you can see, the first one is Her Majesty's British Ambassador to Bahrain, His Excellency Roddy Drummond, who's just going to say a few words to you. Assalamu alaikum. It's Roddy Drummond, the British Ambassador to Bahrain. Warm welcome to both uh, Professor Mark Lewis and Tim King from Sosa Health. I'm really proud that Sosa Health have chosen Bahrain as their first country launch in the MENA region. And their wellness assessment is really relevant, not just for identifying a, a COVID risk score, which you can do, but also making a really positive contribution to preventative health in Bahrain and the GCC. The SOSA and uh, DUHA um, webinar recently launched the Wellness in the Workplace, Protecting Your Employees theme. It was very positively received and with lots of good feedback from the 70 participants. As a result of that, they are now setting up this week six workshops with an option to attend um, physically or um, via live stream webinar. The Bahrain pilot will continue um, through November to the middle of December. Um, with the fantastic delivery partner, the American Mission Hospital, who we all know and trust, um, delivering their health assessment program in the comfort of clients' offices. I'm getting my um, health check done this week, and I'll be looking um, forward to the results and acting on them. This is really important stuff. Um, take care. Stay healthy. It's a great message from the ambassador. And it now gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you Tim King, Chief Executive of Sosa Health. Over to you, Tim. Well, thank you very much. And welcome, everybody. And thank you for your time. And I hope that you find this session useful and beneficial. Uh, I, in turn, am delighted to uh, introduce and welcome Professor Mark Lewis, Lovely University of Mark Lewis. Thank you, Tim. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you again for coming along and joining us uh, this afternoon. And uh, looking forward to speaking to you all again. Thank you. Just a quick word before Tim continues. What he mentioned in his address the partnership with American Mission Hospital is very important. Uh, such a leading institution on the island is partnering up with Sosa Health in the delivery through the pilot program. And we're very proud to have that on board. So without further ado, I'm going to transfer that to you. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to start by giving you a brief introduction about Sosa and explain why we came about. Sosa is the vision of David Wolfson, Walter Wolfson of Sunningdale, who several years ago now asked the question, why do we get ill? And put 10 million US dollars of grant uh, funding um, towards the research project to find the answer. And that research, uh, the research team that we put together reviewed existing peer reviewed literature for eight years and then came up with a set of 
conclusions, which I'll uh, go through um, shortly. The next stage of the journey was that David then spent $3 million and employed a team, including myself, to build over the past five years a health scoring model, which we are going to show in more detail today. The reason why he was so keen to gift this money out to the, to the cause, so to speak, was his belief that national healthcare systems are not going to be able to cope with the demand that's coming from an aging population, growing populations who are um, increasingly presenting to the healthcare systems with long communicable diseases. So his overall goal was to help reduce the healthcare demand curve. So David gave the SOSA team a brief, which was to come up with something that was simple and immediate, something that was personalized and tailored for each individual, and that for the corporate customer was mobile so that employees did not have to leave the office, drive down the road to a clinic and spend a quarter of a day, half a day going through an assessment process. So then we got to the how, which is how do you do health scoring? And the medical literature told us that your body systems are interconnected. If your heart is a little bit degraded, it will cool down your lungs, it will cool down your digestive system and, and everything else. And also that the reverse is true. If you can repair your heart, you will pull your other body systems back up again. The next thing that the literature said is that you don't actually feel ill until you are quite a long way down the road to being ill. And so therefore there is a long period between perfect health and the morning you wake up and say, ouch, this hurts, I need to call the doctor. But what also came out of the literature was that it was possible to measure free disease before the individual can actually feel it. So essentially this is what SOSA does. We are preventative health, we are measurement through assessment, we deliver personalized actionable advice and then if people come back and assess with us again after a year, we can measure the impact of our recommendations and our suggestions. So the challenge then becomes, how do you measure health? How do you measure the levels of mental stress and physical stress within the body? How do you measure your ability to handle stress? And indeed, how do you measure how much people have left in their tank? Are they burnt out? Are they capable of continuing at the same speed? And more recently with COVID-19, we realized quite early on in the process that there were three health factors that were very, very important for determining your survivability if you caught the disease. And those three items were your immune system, respiratory system, and the level of inflammation in your body. And I'll cover those in more detail later on. In listening to customers and listening to friends and listening to the press, three key messages have come out over the course of lockdown as we come out of lockdown. The first one was that underlying health conditions matter. If you are young, fit and healthy, and you catch the virus, you are probably likely to survive it and may not even notice you have the symptoms. If you're older, not as well, underlying health conditions, you are far more at risk if you catch the disease. So that led on to the question, how at risk am I? Am I any more likely to suffer if I catch this disease than the next person? Um, should I be worried? Should I be taking action to protect myself? And then finally, the third question coming up was, is it safe to return to work? A quick explanation of what SOSA is and what it is not. We are not looking for illness or disease. That's the job of your doctor. We leave that side of things to the medical professionals. And so as a consequence, we are not diagnosing for diseases or underlying or, 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 sorry, for diseases. So what is SOSA? Well, we are working out how your body is performing, how healthy it is, and how the body systems are performing in isolation and also in 
integrated with each other. We are working out a pre-disease status. So for example, we are working out if you're 10, 20, 30% of the way to type 2 diabetes. So that if you are, we can tell you and you then have the opportunity to reverse things before you actually go all the way to getting type 2 diabetes and exactly the same for heart disease. So in essence, we are partnering with you to guide you to better and maintain health. Quick word on the assessment process. We were challenged by David Wilson to make the process um, last only one hour. And within that golden hour, we were on 35 minutes of medical tests. They were all point of care, so we can then collect data immediately and nothing goes off to the lab. We then spend about five minutes entering that data into our cloud-based system. We press the button and that will generate a report having calculated how healthy you are. And once that report is generated, the technician who run the tests, uh, run you through the tests, will then spend 15 minutes walking you through your personalized report. And that service can be delivered either at an AMH venue or if you're a corporate, we can come to your site, install in a meeting room and run your employees through one at a time, making sure that no employee is away from their desk for more than one hour at a time. This picture is a picture of the medical devices that we use. These are all either US FDA approved or European Union C marked, which means you will find these devices in any uh, medical institution. It's how we use the data that's different. You'll see that there's a laptop computer there and into the computer we type in the readings that we pull from the devices and then we trigger the cloud process that will generate your report. quick run through the report that you receive and this report is delivered online, securely online. You can view it, view it big screen on tablets or with mobile phone. And we start at the top with a single health score. So this customer uh, score 53, which happens to be the national average score, sorry, the international average score that, that we've seen out of all the people we've assessed. The higher the score, the better. Lower the score, not so good. It's color coded, so red is bad and green is good. Once we've delivered on the overall health score, there are then nine sub scores that sit underneath that, and we always list your worst score first. So here you can see that this person, their inflammation levels in the immune system is scoring a low 30%. At 30%, we're on the threshold of saying you need to see. Uh, independent uh, medical advice from, from medical professionals. You'll notice a plus sign to the side of the word information and immune system on your personalized report. If you click on that, it will then expand out and drill down to the next level of detail, the next level of information. So here we have drilled into the information uh, section scoring of 24 percent so here we're saying you there's something not quite right with your body and something needs um, addressing the issue is always listed with red text a description of what's caused that issue is in black text and then in green text you'll see our recommendations and our guidance and that those recommendations and guidance will almost always be nutritional diet, exercise, and changes in lifestyle. So for example, taking up um, mindfulness, yoga, Pilates. As you continue to drill down into the reports, eventually you'll get to the point where we look at your individual readings. And green is good and yellow is not so good. And if you click on the plus sign, it'll then drill down into the detail. I'm going very quickly through the 35-page report. I've only showed you a couple of a couple of pages. If you want to see a fuller example of how the report works, including the executive summary and the ability to buy the, the products um, that we've recommended to the investment bills, um, very happy to show you share with you the example.
One key point about our report is that we do talk about the importance of lifestyle interventions for your improved health and well-being. And rather than talk to you about that myself, I'm going to pass you over to Professor Mark Lewis from the University of Perth, 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 Perth University. Thank you very much, Tim. Good afternoon, everybody. Both, uh, um, my name is Mark Lewis. Uh, I'm a professor of muscular cities and biology. My background is in physiology and biochemistry. I have a PhD in biochemistry from Imperial College London um, with a specialty in molecular and cellular biology. I'm also the dean of the School of Sport and Exercise and Health Sciences at Huffington University. We are part of the senior leadership team of, of that institution. Um, and I'm going to start by asking um, if anybody in the room or online has ever heard of Huffington University. Raise your hands if you have. Very good. Um, next slide, please, Paul. Um, why am I mentioning that? Well, I mentioned it because it's good for my ego. I mentioned it because actually, in terms of um, sport related subjects, we're, we're number one university in the world and have been for the last four years. Uh, that isn't something that I measure, that's something someone else measures. And why am I mentioning that? Well, I mentioned it because the institutions had decades and decades of experience of measuring human physiology and human biochemistry and performance assessing. And really what I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about is, is relaying that kind of translation to performance. But performance isn't uh, elite sporting performance. Performance is our own performance as human beings and our health. And I'm going to touch on a number of times on um, concepts such as marginal gains and the things that we can do to be able to put ourselves in the best position to live long and healthy lives. Um, excuse me while I turn my back on the slide on the screen. But essentially this tells us, shows us, the burden um, of non communicable disease in the world, 1990 to 2017. The left hand side is the number of years of life lost or lived with disability. So, where you see 1 billion, that's 1 billion years of life lost or years lived with a disability in, in the world. Um, and I think what's most shocking about this graph is one, the scale of the numbers, but also the fact that these are non communicable diseases. So, these are not viral infections, these are bacterial infections. This is a uh, major trauma or warfare. Uh, this is not cancer or genetic disease. This is non communicable diseases, or indeed, to paraphrase, things we do to ourselves. So, if you look on the right hand side of some of the, the main players in this, you can see cardiovascular disease, muscular skeletal disorders, uh, diabetes, and endocrine diseases, amongst others. Uh, and as I've already said, the most striking thing about these is the sheer volume of, of, of the numbers. But also the fact that these are all things that we can do something about. Next slide, please. Um, this is the most shocking number, really, uh, for me. Non communicable diseases kill 41 million people each year, equivalent to 71% of all deaths globally. And they're all modifiable behaviours. By modifiable behaviours, I mean things such as tobacco use, physical inactivity, unhealthy diet, and harmful use of alcohol, which all increase the risk of non communicable diseases. All things that we can do something about. Um, and on the slide here, on the left hand side, you can see again a number of these uh, behaviours. Um, and then you can see mortality of thousands broken down by those behaviours. There are a number of things there which are relevant to the conversation today. One of the things I want to highlight is physical inactivity. Um, physical inactivity is responsible for thousands and thousands, uh, millions in fact, uh, of deaths a year annually. And as you can see by the uh, different colours in, in the bars, it doesn't really matter whether it's a high income, middle income, or low income country. This is pervasive throughout the whole of the, um, the, whole of the, of the world. Next slide. Please. As an example of one of those modifiable factors, um, physically active, being physically active um, plays an essential role in ensuring health and well-being. Inactivity is the fourth leading risk factor for global mortality, 6% of deaths globally. Have a think about that. Fourth leading risk factor in the, in the globally is inactivity. Which is something every single person in this room, on this webinar, and in all the populations we deal with and, and live with and work with, can do something about. Uh, unfortunately, sedentary lifestyles are on the rise. Approximately 31% of the world's population are not meeting activity guidelines. Every country's public health system has a recommendation for the amount of physical activity that the individuals should be taking for a healthy lifestyle. Um, I'm not talking about winning Olympic medals here, I'm talking about a healthy lifestyle. Uh, and the majority of um, a large proportion of the world's population are not, are not able to meet those um, guidelines. Next slide. So, what, what do we need to do about it? Well, I think there's a societal need to motivate and educate people to take control of their health. Um, 
we found over the last six to seven months that one of the uh, major areas of anxiety for individuals is, is control. They feel that they're not going to be control of, of their destiny, they're not control of what will happen to them next. Um, some of these modifiable factors, things that we can do something about for that enable people to take control of their health. And in fact, um, it's been shown, and we're going to allude to it a number of times through, through the course of this seminar, is that good health is highly protective against the negative effects of COVID-19. People are going to get infected by the virus, that will happen, it's, it's an infectious disease. But the ability of people to be, un, if not untouched, relatively unscathed from COVID-19 is totally related to their own health. Um, we need to provide education to increase understanding that health is largely determined by their own life choices to guide people to improve their health. We need to recognise that results in health and, the results of health and well-being is benefits not just individuals, but it's also the wider population of people, both society, the society they live in, the people they work with, the organisations they work with. Um, one of the big areas um, where this has been driven in the UK is through, you'll see the bottom left hand corner, there's a logo from the National Centre for Sport and Exercise Medicine. Um, that was a 2012 um, Olympic legacy in the UK to improve the nation's self sport, exercise, and physical activity. And that's driven by advances in sport and exercise medicine science, underpinning a move towards improved public health and wellbeing. And so those disciplines are recognised as critical in prevention and treatment of chronic diseases, as is the role of key technologies in forming lifestyle choices. And that's another really important. One, we can do something about this stuff. And two, technology's moved on so quickly, I'm sure everyone in the room, or people on, on the call, are wearing, a, are wearing a device, a Fitbit, or an Apple Watch, or something which monitors physical activity and other physiological um, and health parameters. There are so many tools now which are coming into the market, um, which enable people to be able to take control of their health and be able to see the result of interventions, and I believe so the health is another one of those. Um, um, in fact, sorry, we'll just a bit back to the sorry, the same, don't worry. Um, during the course of the, um, the, the full lockdown in the UK, um, government data suggested that uh, individuals were becoming more active, 15 minutes a day more active than they were before. The only thing that people could get out of the house to do was go to the supermarket or do some physical activity. Uh, and, but the result of that physical activity was having on people's health was really dramatic. Um, one of the things I often hear in this sphere is, is people assuming that you have to go and work out for an hour uh, and that's the only way you're going to get positive response. In fact, sedentary people doing only 15 minutes um, additional physical activity a week or additional physical activity a week show remarkably increases their cardiovascular parameters. It brings their risk of death down to cardiovascular disease considerably just from doing that small amount of work. And one of the things I'm going to talk about um, which I think is important, it is small interventions that people can make for, for, for large return. And that's really this concept of, of marginal gains. Um, some of you may be uh, aware of um, an individual uh, called David Brownsford, who worked for British Cycle in the UK. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Britain had never won, had not won a gold medal or any kind of medal in the Olympic cycle for 100 years and never won a tour. Um, these individuals got together to try and change that. And really what underpinned the whole thing was this principle of marginal gains. And that comes from the idea that if you break down everything that you can think of which goes to um, contribute towards an activity, and you improve all of those things by just 1%, all the gains added together are much are, are more than incremental. They kind, of, um, they kind of amplify each other to have huge effects. And I think that's absolutely true in terms of... Um, in terms of um, this space as well. You can see here on this graph, um, there's a, um, if you improve 1% better every day, that's 1 to the power of 365, you get approximately 40 times gain. If it's 1% worse every day, you get a, point, uh, a 5% um, deficit. And it just goes to show that just very small changes, but done together and over time, it leads to huge, huge differences. Um, and so that's why kind of really all the things that we've learned from uh, human physiology um, and biochemistry of all sorts of individuals have translated into this. And I think that's really the key message I want to get out of is that small changes can make a huge difference. But how do, how do you know about those small changes and how do you keep monitoring them? And there's so many things which are now around to be able to do that. And so health, I think, is a really powerful player in that market. You have to really understand yourself, you have to take control for yourself, and be able to. Um, live longer and happier lives, and also make yourself resilient 
for the next thing which comes around the corner. So it's been COVID-19 this year, who knows what will be next. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I'd like to now pass you back to Tim, who's going to give some insights on the corporate. Thank you very much, Paul. So now we move to the corporate side of this presentation. And so started looking at the corporate um, benefits of employee health and wealth and wellness by asking a number of questions. And they included, does ill health drive absenteeism? What are the consequences of adverse health events? Are healthy employees more productive? Does assisting with employee health drive loyalty? Does corporate wellness drive organization's commitment to its corporate social responsibility? And for the accountants amongst us, does employee health and wellness deliver a financial return on investment? Moving on to the topic of risk management, and this photo came about after a conversation with a corporate client who had a, a large operation, warehouse operation. And she said to me, Tim, it's not just an individual who um, suffers if they have an adverse health event in my warehouse. Um, and here you have a, 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 an image of such a scene. She said that forklift truck could then career into the shelving and destroy or damage expensive stock. But worse, that falling stock could actually injure other, uh, injure other employees. And so from a risk management perspective, the cost of one individual's health event, um, and, and obviously it's awful for the individual, but the cost of the business, of the knock-on effects, of all that knock-on uh, damage and risk, um, very quickly add up to a very large number. And she said to me, Tim, do, you really, do I really want to have people who are, are at risk of a serious health event operating key machinery? So what, what does SOSA do? It's a wellness assessment system and it provides key information to both the employee and the employer. To the employee, a personalised uh, report that we've already been through, but then we take that health data from the employees, we anonymise it and we then present it to the employer in the form of a wellness dashboard. And this dashboard provides an awareness to the employer of which health factors uh, exist in the organisation and where they sit on the wellness spectrum. And that enables the employer to create a wellness strategy to reduce absenteeism, optimise performance, productivity and boost morale. I'm now going to quickly go through some of the uh, a subset of the corporate analytics dashboard that we produce um, and just talk you through some of the, some of the uh, analytics. So in this visual, visual the organization's overall score, score was 53%, and that's the average score for the organization, which is right on the average we have for all the people we assessed. But there was a difference between uh, the male population and the female population. And we were able to drill in and figure out what, what, what was causing that difference and how we could fix it. On the right-hand side, we drill down from the top health score into nine sub-scores, and you can see that there's quite a range. So the lowest here, the heart system, average score 48, nutrition 46. But on the upside, inflammation on average was scoring at 80%. So quite a wide range of scores. We are also able to analyze this information not only by gender, but by ethnicity and by age cohorts, and we have a lot of slides in our analytics presentation um, that go into that detail, and you're very welcome to ask for a copy of that um, presentation if you like it. Moving on to where to focus for the organisation. Uh, for this organisation, the two biggest issues in their business were the level of uh, nutrition for, in, their, in their employees, and problems that their employees had with um, heart issues. But then when we focus in 
on the differences between the male and female population. For the male population, it's nutritional issues followed by digestive issues, whereas for the female population, it was hydration and then nutritional. And actually, 80% of the difference in the score between females and males was down to the ladies being dehydrated. So 80% of, of the inequality was resolvable by encouraging the female population to rehydrate. Looking very briefly at stress, and we have an overall stress score, we break it down into mental and physical stress scores, which is this uh, mental stress here, and then the ability to handle mental stress, and the final column on the right hand side, what is left in the tank. And you can see here that if we take the overall stress column on the left hand side, the average score for the organisation was 65, but there was a very, very wide range of scores, the best being 95 and the worst being 19. And when somebody scores 19, uh, that is an issue and they need to see uh, immediate uh, professional medical assistance. Um, it goes beyond what says you can do, they need to be able to leave it to the medical professionals. We talked a little earlier about the three, the COVID three risk factors. These, these are uh, three risk factors that if you catch the disease, and we so it's not, not do anything to help you um, not catch it, you, you can catch it because if, it, if you're exposed to uh, anybody who's infectious. But the three underlying risk factors um, do contribute to your chances of surviving the disease if you do contract it. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about now. So the top row, moving left to right, is the overall COVID risk score um, for the population here, and you can see the class 55. And in this example, I've then broken it down, and I'm showing you going left to right, the different scores for different um, uh, ethnic ethnicities, uh, with quite a significant range of the Indian population scoring 56%. Uh, the African, um, there's an Af African ethnicity at 50, so quite a 10% quite a range there. And a small difference between males and females. And as we go down, the next row down, inflammation, again, you can see some variances there. And then respiratory, and finally, the immune system. Looking at the same four. COVID risk factors, the overall score and the three underlying scores about this time by age, you can see that COVID scores um, are reduced to by age, the top left hand um, segment here. And that means um, if your score is low, um, your COVID score is low, it means your risk is getting higher. And unsurprisingly, the older you get, uh, the more at risk uh, you are of complications if you catch the disease, uh, sorry, the, the virus. For the immune system, a quick bit of analysis, the overall population scored an average of 77, a very little difference between males and females, highest score 100, lowest score 26. That individual at 26, again, was advised to seek medical uh, intervention. And in fact, five people in this population were out of range and were advised to go and seek help. And at the bottom, you can see the differences between ethnicity and the, in the middle, the differences between gender as people age. We then repeat the same analysis for the respiratory scores with a similar sort of range, although the variances are a little bit less. But look here at respiratory scores, the worst person was scoring 10%. I mean, they are in. Um, it's in trouble, frankly, have COPD, um, they, they, need, they, they need medical help. And finally, the inflammation score, and again, you'll see a little bit of variance in the scores, and six people in this population sample were uh, advised to seek professional medical guidance. Quickly on a case study, a uh, Swedish company called Tometic, went into the UK head office and assessed all the people. No person was away from the desk for more than one hour, and each individual received their personal report. 
with an anonymised data and presented the analytics to the senior management team. On the back of that, we were requested to provide ongoing customised on the service and invited to um, pitch to uh, roll out to other international offices, um, which we look to be doing in 2021. Uh, Sophie Poiré, the uh, managing director of the UK business, said to him, attitudes to health have changed in the office since you folks came in. People value this. And I'm going to pass back to Paul, who's going to talk to you about the Thank you very much, Tim. Um, a ridiculous amount of information, and what we don't want you to do is feel that the assessment is complex. As Tim mentioned, it's one hour, 35 minutes of poly care testing, done in the comforts of your office or at one of the MH venues. How do you put that into perspective for your organisation, whether that's uh, an enterprise, whether it's a retail business, or whether it's an education business. So building a health case is really looking at the data that's generally available to us all. Um, a couple of things that we picked out. One, the UK government announced earlier this year that they were worried about the impact of lockdown and they identified that very obese people were 200% more likely to die. So going back to what Mark was saying, inactivity, uh, if you were overweight, 26% more likely to die from COVID-19. Now that's not me being a sort of scare tactic, it's just identifying what the UK government were concerned about when they were looking at the statistics. We're also very mindful that uh, the economic impact of pandemic is putting a huge amount of pressure on business, particularly in certain sectors, and as government is supporting those sectors with financial aid, that will, that will stop at some point. And companies are advertising openly that they need more money, otherwise they're going to have to reduce their, their workforce. As an example, if you have 100 people in your team and you have to lose 20 for the reasons we know about, then the 80 remaining have to be 25% more efficient just for the business to stand still. What we also identified in our earlier webinar through Dr. Gardenia was talking about distress and stress as a business. Burnout the impacts of that, but also errors in performance, emotional issues in a company, people becoming anxious, depressed. And I think most of us will actually put our hands up and say, that's me in certain aspects of that. Am I more irritable? And I think that the work-life integration is becoming highly challenging, particularly for those women who are trying to have a career, be a mum, look after the house, and now adding in some homeschooling as well. So there is a high risk of burnout and increased personal conflict with conflicts uh, could happen, lower productivity, increased absenteeism. So all these things are very real factors that the challenges facing the executive of the company, you guys, who are looking at your, your particular business and saying, is that me and what can I do about it? And so there is a real added value to try and head off some of these issues before they become major challenges. The business case um, is even simpler to be honest. Um, we know from the World Economic Forum that they stipulate Non-communicable diseases are a leading threat to economic recovery and growth. The impact on loyalty, Price Waterhouse Cooper report the wellness program can reduce staff turnover by 10%. There's probably about 10 minutes left. All right. 74% of European CDRE occupiers do have an existing wellness program in place. 
And as a result of those wellness programs, 80% of employees in the US would like to work with a company who do have a wellness offering. So if you want to attract high talent, then have a wellness offering. If you want to retain them, then have a wellness program in place. Otherwise, your staff turnover can be quite serious. Absenteeism, and all of these numbers are pre COVID, so they, they certainly won't be improving uh, during this last year. The UK in 2006 lost 175 million working days at a cost of $27 billion. In the UK, stress related absenteeism loses 10.4 million days per annum. In the US, the combination of absenteeism and presenteeism is estimated at 227 million numbers of eye uh, And in Europe in 2013, a matrix report said that work-related depression was costing business 727 billion. So all these are factors, and it's then how do we sort of look at where we are today, how we are with some of these reports and put it into something that brings it really down from 30,000 feet down to your business. So I've looked at three areas, absenteeism, loyalty, and productivity. So we have a, a mythical business with 100 employees. The SOSA Health Wellness Assessment Program during the pilot program from now to the end of the year will cost 40 BB per person. So if you were to do the whole of your organization, that's a uh, cost of 4,000 BB, which is a very low figure, although we know the economic challenges in that. This number you can adjust, but if we look at the average days of sick per annum, per employee, it's about 10. And if we took a, an average salary, including all the benefits, 17,000 BD, dividing that by days worked per year, we come up with a, a price of around 82 BD per day. When someone's away off sick, there are additional costs, whether that's the management of the paper process, looking at doctor's notes, impact on the productivity of the co-worker who can't get that piece of information to give you that valuable report or it could be i've got to bring in a supply teacher and there are various areas that impact but you can evaluate this you can look at what the true cost per day for sickness is so 97 bd here it's far more than the 40 bd cost for assessment multiply that out, it could be as much as 100,000 BD per annum. We then look at that and we say, if we can reduce absenteeism by just one day per person per annum, be 10%, then the cost savings in the organization would be 10% of 97, 9,700. Versus the cost of the assessment program, seeing a cost upside of 5.7, which is an ROI of 144%. That's just one topic. We talked about loyalty and how the wellness program can improve loyalty. So again, our mythical company with 100 employees with the cost. And if you have staff rotation leaving per annum, we know that in government that's going to be less. But uh, in certain form, particularly retail and education, where it can get to levels of 30%. If we use 20 as a, an example, let me think of all the time and the, the money that's expended on agency fees, flights, visas, medical accommodation, training, and the total cost approximately of 1500 BD, then to reduce that figure, 20% of 20 is four, times of 1,500 is a saving of 6,000 BD. 
again versus the cost for looking at a cost saving at 2000. And I actually think this figure is relatively low because as an employer I know talking to the recruitment agency, going through CVs, going through uh, interviews is a lengthy, we all know that retention is a far better policy than recruitment. Productivity can be measured in lots of ways. It can be measured in EBITDA divided by employee can be profitability. I've just looked at a very low company sales figure here. Divided by 100 is 5,000. Um, we know that this is too low if you've got average salary of 17,000, but it's a low figure just to give you an indication. So if we took our top 20 employees senior management or uh, senior leadership teams or foremen working on the shop floor and we improve their productivity by 10% then you're looking at a gain of 6,000 so 150 so, so what we encourage each executive HR accountant principal is to look at which area would be most relevant? One, two, three, or a combination of all three. You just run a slide roll over some of these costs, and you can see that you could get an ROI up to five, six hundred percent. So the financial implication of the starts to disappear. And the one thing we sort of ask you to consider is. If you're going out for a brunch this weekend, what's the cost of the brunch for the pair of you? If you go to the salon, what's the cost of the salon? Um, Tim and Mark have just flown in from the UK and uh, their COVID test, their visa cost was greater than the 40, so you're actually for that 40 BD getting a full body assessment. So it's not a high cost, but it's a great ROI that you can work with. Benefits to your team are very, very clear. They're getting very good information, detailed reports, and talking about their health and wellness. There is a personal preventative health plan resulting in improved health, energy, reduced stress, better sleep. And the immediate benefit is a possibility to improve immune respiratory systems to reduce those underlying health risks. And we use the, 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 the government as an example here that if we're working two weeks on, two weeks off, and we, we have this with, with the kids at school, if you have a low immune and a poor respiratory system, your chances, uh, once you catch this, of becoming seriously ill, then you really shouldn't be going back into the workplace. Whereas those people with a high immunity and respiratory may have it, but they're fine. Uh, chances of passing it on is something that social distancing will reduce. But this gives you a very clear indication of where your workforce are in terms of COVID-19 risk. So we have a little slogan here, which is healthy people run and manage healthy companies, universities, schools, uh, retail organizations. That's it. So I'm going to pass it out to the floor uh, and, and those on a virtual connection. Are there any questions that you'd like to ask Professor Mark Lewis? Tim King or myself that can maybe fill some of the gaps and some questions. Very quiet. Very quiet. Nothing in the chat room? Nothing in the chat room. Right. So just talk about some next steps. Uh, talking about partner delivery 
talking about the pilot, communication. We can actually show you the devices that we use. The delivery partner, we talked about on a couple of occasions, American Mission Hospital, they have a number of facilities across the island, but taking this into corporate headquarters, the university, the school, um, will avoid going into the hospital location. That American Mission Hospital have probably got one of the best reputations on the island. We're also very proud to work with the Economic Development Board, Chamber of Commerce, and you've seen with the Ambassador coming in and supporting SOSA Health, the Department for International Trade. To complete the picture, we're working with Tazor, one of the leading insurance companies on the island, protection insurance services, one of the leading brokers, and one of the leading TBAs, GlobeNet. And through the pilot program, we've been identifying true cost, operational challenges, and what the latent demand for uh, this assessment program will be so that we can better plan for 2021. We've also got standby, Dr. Gardenia, Greg Patalco, we've all worked closely, if you remember from the uh, webinar, Dr. Gardenia was talking about burnout, and Tom Ham from standby was talking about risk management in enterprise organisations. Our pilot will provide a superb opportunity for you all to experience a SOSA health assessment. For individuals to receive their personalised report and action plan. For corporates to receive their anonymised dashboard enabling. You to support your organisation, prepare for a return to the workplace with confidence. Also for you to implement a wellness programme to support short, medium, long-term organisational health. The start date is the 1st of November with an end date of the 15th of December. Please note the promotional price of 40 BD per assessment is less than 50% of the European price. Next steps, please email me paul at dhub.com that's dhu3.com to register your interest we can discuss and then enabling you to place your firm order for a social health assessment program within your organization we will then agree a schedule of employees times and venue where the individual reports will be available as soon as the employees are assessed and your corporate analytics will be available one week after the program completion. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Her Majesty's Ambassador, Mr. Tim King, Professor Mark Lewis, and all of you for attending this workshop slash webinar. We look forward to working with you in the coming weeks and wish you all the very best. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.